the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, how do British supermarkets ship green bananas all the way from Costa Rica and get them onto their shelves just as they start to ripen? Swedish Vikings were famous for their love of the axe, and today we'll learn about one of the oldest tools in man's toolbox. And turning junk into jewellery, we'll see how the platinum from recycled computers is turned into an A-lister's accessories. But first, when you think of sun and sand, holidays in the Caribbean are usually what spring to mind. But have you ever thought about solar panels instead? The main ingredient that makes them work is silicon, or sand, which comes from rocks found in a quarry like this. It's out of the quarry and into the fire. The first stage is to get the silicon out of the rocks, and that's done in this enormous furnace. Temperatures reach well over 2,000 degrees Celsius. This is unbelievably hot and also quite dangerous. To keep their eyebrows safe, the men work the ore using long poles. Silicon is used to make everything from window glass to the processes in your home computer. And without it, a solar panel just wouldn't work. Huge barrels are used to carry it around the factory. Nothing else could withstand the immense heat involved. In this form, it is liquid molten silicon, but to make solar panels, certain chemicals need to be added to it. First, the ore needs to be crystallized, which occurs here in this cooling machine. The silicon is so hot it could melt right through it, but the boffins have come up with a solution. Cold water is pumped round it as it works, which acts like watery air conditioning. The super-hot crystallized silicon emerges from the machine. But how will this help to harness energy from the sun? Solar panels are made using thin slices of silicon which have two unique layers in them. These are created using two chemical processes which affect the silicon at different times during production. Time for stage one. This is where the first chemical is added. It will help make the silicon more conductive. To get the two combined properly, the tank is sealed into a large furnace and left for two days. It's like cooking a big stew and the chef keeps a close eye on his recipe. When the buzzer rings, the cooking is complete. The furnace is opened and the silicon block emerges. This block would be far too big to put on your roof, which is where solar panels usually go. The average roof wouldn't support it, so now it needs to be cut down to size. Cutting solid crystal isn't like cutting butter. It can be very dangerous, so a protective shield is raised to keep workers safe. Diamond tip blades then slice through it, cutting individual panel-sized columns ready for the next stage. The columns are now the right size, but they are still far too thick to convert the sun's energy into electricity. So they need to be cut down even further by this machine. It has hundreds of spinning wires which slice their way slowly through each column. What they leave behind is wafer-thin sheets of silicon crystal, perfect for solar panels. The slices must be separated to be cleaned, but no machine exists that's sensitive enough to do it without breaking them. It must be done by hand because the panels are barely fingernail width and incredibly fragile. Wherever humans are part of a process, contamination follows because we release millions of dust particles. The freshly cut slices must now be thoroughly washed before they can be treated with the second chemical. Once the treatment is in place, the panels are returned to the furnace and baked to create the two separate layers. 
No, this isn't a pattern for a new kind of urban camouflage. It's the basic unit that makes up a larger solar panel. It comes in two different colors, but this isn't a fashion statement. The blue shade is added so the panel can absorb more light and make more energy. The panels are also treated with an anti-reflective coating, which is painted on and then baked into place. Any light the panel reflects would simply be wasted energy. Now, the panels are clean, properly treated and wearing this season's colors. They're ready to make electricity, but how do you get power out of them? High-tech computers align the panels and the next machine paints a layer of this gray gunge onto them. It looks like bad school custard, but it's actually semi-liquid metal. It helps conduct energy from the panel into the electricity grid and through a plug into whatever appliance you're using. We can now assemble a full-sized solar panel. Each wafer acts like a battery that generates its own electricity. But to get power out, the panels are assembled in rows connected by metallic pathways. With neat rows all hooked up, the machine can put all the pieces together. It's like making a gigantic chip butty, only the chips are made of silicon. A large slice of glass makes the base, followed by layers of adhesive paper, the silicon panels, and more adhesive to hold it in place. The final layer is the frame to hold it all together. Even though English weather isn't always sunny, solar panels can work in our cloudy conditions. They just need to be cleaned, installed, and plugged in. So as Britain's summers get sunnier, solar panels will work to help us cut down our harmful carbon emissions. It's official. Bananas are the most popular fruit in the UK, and we scoffed almost one billion of them last year. But unlike apples or pears, we import our bananas from far off places. Here in Costa Rica, this plantation is the size of 324 football pitches. The workers use a pulley system to get themselves around. It's meant to transport the fruit, but catching a lift saves them from walking. Modern bananas are sterile, so each new plant must be taken from an old cutting. This is pretty tough work as the plants can grow several meters tall. If the workers didn't replant each year, the plantation would stop producing. Once the fruit begins to emerge, the plants must be pruned. The large purple flowers at the base divert energy that would produce bigger, tastier bananas, so the workers remove it. The remaining bunches are put into bags coated with insecticides to protect them from being eaten. To keep the insects at bay, the crops are also sprayed, but not by an aeroplane. They use a high-tech chopper, which is more agile. It's controlled by satellite technology, which stops local workers being covered with pesticides in their own homes. These bananas have a radius of three centimeters, and although they're not ripe yet, now is the perfect time to collect them. When the fruit has reached this ideal size, these guys have the job of preparing them for the packing plant. Their protective bags are removed and foam inserts are placed between the bunches. If the fruit have even the tiniest bruises, UK customers leave them on the shelf, so they're protected right from the start. Enormous bunches are loaded onto the pulley system and join a long traffic jam of other fruit heading for the processing plant. Now, you'd need an enormous trolley to buy a bunch of 60 bananas with your weekly shopping. So now they're separated into smaller ones before being sent for a bath.
tough EU laws legislate for bananas' size, shape and even their curve. So the workers must be sure there are no slip-ups with any fruit that aren't up to scratch. Any that fail are thrown onto the waste conveyor, but they aren't discarded. They'll be used to feed local livestock or sent to be processed into baby food. The remaining bananas are then sent off for another bath, which kills off any spiders who may be trying to hitch a ride to a supermarket near you. The fruit is given its trademark branding and boxes are built to store them for their long journey across the Atlantic. This plantation has produced over 270,000 boxes of bananas. They're packed up and sent by the lorry load to the docks. Here, they're put on board ships in specially cooled containers for the journey to Europe. They won't be enjoying any sun on the deck, though. It's an 11-day journey, and being in the sun would ripen them too early. When they're finally unloaded, the bananas are still green. This means they can be stored until the shops need them. They're stacked in sealed ripening rooms. When the stores need them, these rooms will be flooded with ethylene gas. This gas ripens the bananas at a regular, measurable pace, which means the stores know exactly when they are ready for the shelves. So, from the exotic fields of a Costa Rican plantation to the supermarket trolley in the UK, the Brits are certainly bananas about their bananas. Still to come, the wood axe is forged in the flames of a Swedish furnace. We'll find out just how that works and you need a platinum credit card to buy a platinum ring, but we'll find out how scientists can turn junk into jewellery. Whether you think of roaring log fires and the outdoors way of life, or a scene from your favorite horror film, the wood axe is one of the oldest tools used by man. This Swedish axe master can make a new axe head using solid steel, a blast furnace, and a few wax from his industrial hammer. To get the steel soft enough to shape it, he feeds solid bars of it into the heart of his forge. He has to use pincers because it burns at an incredible 1200 degrees Celsius. Once it's red hot, he can slice through it like soft toffee. A lump the size of a fist will be enough to make an axe head, but he knows he can't hang around. By the tenth whack, his axe is already starting to take shape. Successive blows help to finish it off and compress the metal for strength. Now, even the toughest of Vikings needed a handle to wield an axe, so the blacksmith has got to include a hole for one. But he's working against the clock here because the metal is cooling fast. He inserts a steel peg, which is hammered into place. It'll press the hole wide enough for the handle. The same is done from the other side to ensure the hole goes all the way through. As the blade head cools, the red glow dies and it's becoming harder to shape it. But the last blow doesn't need much power. The final whack puts his personal stamp on the axe and his work is done. Over 50,000 axes are made here every year and that means the company has a reputation to uphold. So as well as making strong axes, there's the small matter of making them sharp too. Using his full body weight, the sharpener leans each blade into the grinding wheel, giving it a razor-sharp edge. Conveniently, it also shines up the blade so it'll glitter nicely in the sun. Once the sharpening is complete, the blade must be hardened. Steel may feel tough, but depending on its carbon content, it can be quite soft. The axe head is passed through a machine which heats it up, and then it's dropped into a bath of cold water. This process doubles the hardness of the steel, which will help it last longer. 
All this activity has excited the metal. It's not jumping up and down and shouting a lot, but the molecules in the metal are now very active. When this happens, the blade can become fragile, so they're now placed in what's called a relaxing furnace. Here they are heated for an hour at 195 degrees Celsius. Once the blades are cool, calm and collected, they're ready to face the double tap safety test. Before they're ready to chop some trunks though, they need a quick makeover. A quick shine helps to enhance that powerful, menacing look. Here you can see the difference it can make. The first blade is the raw metal, the second one has been ground down and sharpened, and the final one here has been polished and it's ready to chop some firewood. Finally, the blades are oiled. This protects them from rust and corrosion. All that's missing is something to hold it with. Funnily enough, the axe that will cut down trees ends up with a wooden handle. It's strong but also flexible enough to withstand the impacts it experiences. The handle guy inserts a steel collar into the blade. The wood has been cut to fit this, but he still needs to use an air compressor to get the two together. A quick test makes sure it's seated properly, and then a wedge of wood will be glued into the end. This looks quite simple, but it spreads the handle out and stops it from slipping free. A tough woodsman wouldn't look so tough if his blade was to fly off and hit someone. There's just time for the final trim to remove the excess wood and a quick visit to the sander before a brand new chopper is ready for action. So like the actor wielding it in a horror film, the woodsman's axe has been very well pampered to get it ready for its close-up. If you want to show her you love her, an engagement ring is a nice touch. But don't be fooled by cheap imitations like ordinary gold. If you really want to sweep someone off their feet, only platinum will do. It's expensive stuff worth twice as much per kilo as gold is, so it's kept under lock and key. But because it's also quite rare, workers recycle and reuse it wherever possible. And that's where this box of industrial waste comes in. Contained within this waste is pure platinum, and the brainiacs at this chemical plant are going to separate it out from the other metals. All the debris is put into this enormous glass flask. The glass is important because it resists the chemicals they are about to use. Yes, this is the fun bit of chemistry. Nitric acid and hydrochloric acid are poured in, then the flask is sealed. Over the next two days, the metals will dissolve until all you're left with is this acidic black soup. Platinum recovery is like a big experiment, only the scientists know what the outcome is going to be. The next stage is to separate the platinum from the other metals, and that's done with this powder. The powder is added at the top of the flask, and as it filters down, the platinum particles stick to it, leaving the other cheaper metals behind. Slowly, it settles to the bottom, and once the scientists are happy, all the liquid will be drained off, leaving them with a big bucket of sand-like grit. Now, you might have a hard time convincing anyone that this is the most valuable metal in the world, so the grit is then placed into trays and incinerated. At 950 degrees Celsius, everything but the metal is burned off. And when the boffins open up the furnace, what's left looks like asphalt. It's actually platinum, but it's been filled with air bubbles from the furnace. To turn it into the shiny metal that's so sought after for making jewelry, it needs to be reheated in an airtight furnace. 
This powerful oven can reach 2,000 degrees Celsius and can be kept airtight while it does this. The platinum slag is added in, the heat is turned up, and the aerated metal is melted down. The lid is then closed and all the air extracted. Even the Terminator wouldn't survive in here. What emerges has to be the most expensive brick in the world. Just one kilo of this precious metal is worth over 20,000 pounds. In this form, it would be a bit awkward to wear, so specialists at the factory turn the blocks into tubes. Jewelers can use them to make rings or any other jewelry your girlfriend might want. Slices are cut off the tube in a sealed environment to ensure nothing is lost. And this is what you end up with. Gold and silver are weak, so they're mixed with other metals to strengthen them, but this reduces their value. Platinum is strong enough to be worked alone, which is another reason it's so valuable. Sizing is quite a simple process, but if the customer prefers a thinner style, more metal must be carved away. Using a lathe lubricated with high-quality oil, micro-fine slivers of the ring are carved away. Again, nothing is wasted, and the jeweler and the computer both keep a very close eye on what's going on. Because it's so rare and your girlfriend isn't going to want any old ring, platinum jewellery is often made to order. Only experts get to work with this precious metal and they have to know what they're doing. Heat is the most common tool. Melting the metal makes it pliable, but if he keeps the flame on too long, the ring will collapse into an expensive but ugly blob. Another tool that can be used to create a mount for jewels is this saw. Tiny quantities of the ring are carved away to create the setting for the gemstone to fit into it. Now, you could try this with your Black & Decker workmate, but we really wouldn't advise it. Alternatively, smaller stones can be placed into ready-made settings like this one. An electric hammer gently closes the metal around the stone, which will hold it in place. And finally, the ring is polished, ready to be worn. Gold and silver change colour as they age, but because of its purity, platinum doesn't. So like the credit card you've always dreamed of, this is platinum, and it's worth twice its weight in gold.